first, there was commercial cargo. Then we got commercial crew. And now we will soon have commercial space stations. A new space race is happening right now, and I don't think it's getting nearly enough attention. We're on the verge of an entirely new economy that is going to reshape how humans live and work, not only in space, but on Earth as well. So what does that future look like? Welcome to tomorrow. Let's get into it. Let's start with why we need commercial space stations. For decades, the International Space Station has been a hub of scientific research and international cooperation, my favorite part. But the International Space Station is getting old, and NASA plans to retire it by 2030. NASA doesn't want to lose the capability that the ISS gives them, though. A lot of people may not realize that the International Space Station is a national laboratory for the United States. It hosts a wide range of government-backed research projects, and NASA has a really vested interest in continuing those projects on future space stations. Which is why NASA has initiated a new competition to still do all of that kind of stuff. But it's not just NASA. These stations could open the door to new research opportunities that have been stuck on long waiting lists to get aboard the ISS. Whether it's microgravity science, life sciences, or even materials research, Many industries are very eager to take advantage of space-based experimentation. And then there's the pharmaceutical sector, which could be a huge source of revenue. Microgravity has unique effects on the human body, and pharmaceutical companies are already investing heavily into space research to discover new treatments and new medications. Just think about it for a second. If Big Pharma wants more access to space for drug development, that's a massive source of funding that these commercial space stations could tap into. Instead of one station in low Earth orbit, we could see multiple stations, perhaps even serving different purposes. To understand how commercial space stations even became a thing, we have to go back to 2014 when NASA launched the Next Step program. The goal of that ongoing program, it's not finished yet, is to collaborate with private companies to advance human space exploration and commercial spaceflight. This has started lots of new projects from spacesuits to ion thrusters, life support systems, robotic landers, and human landers for traveling to the moon. This program got all of that stuff started, including habitats for astronauts in space. Perhaps the most important early player was Bigelow Aerospace with their BEAM module, the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, which is still attached to the International Space Station today, and was one of the first examples of how expandable habitats could be used for future space stations. Bigelow proved that not just their inflatable technology, but that a commercial company could safely expand the International Space Station and pave the way for more partnerships. Unfortunately for us all, Bigelow Aerospace wasn't able to survive the past four years and all of the shutdowns due to the pandemic, so they laid off all of their employees and they seem to be defunct right now. Despite that, they laid the foundation for the companies that followed. And because the inflatables were NASA technology to begin with, and not necessarily Bigelow's IP or intellectual property, other companies could continue working on inflatables. I have a lot more to say on that subject so that we can discuss in a future video, but for now, let's move on. Building on the Next Step program, NASA launched the Commercial LEO Destinations Program, Low Earth Orbit, aimed at ensuring a smooth transition from the International Space Station to privately operated space stations. NASA is offering technical support and funding to help those companies develop their space stations, ensuring that scientific research and human presence in low Earth orbit can continue long after the International Space Station is commissioned. Initially, NASA chose four programs to take part in the Destination Program. First up, we have Axiom Space. Axiom plans to build modules that will initially attach to the International Space Station and then later detach to form their own independent station. They're targeting the late 2020s for full operations, and at least to me, what makes Axiom unique is its leadership. 
Many of their executives, including their CEO, Mike Suffordini, are former NASA managers who were directly involved with the International Space Station program. They're also employing experienced astronauts like Peggy Whitson and Michael Lopez Alegria to bring their vision to life. Axiom also seems to be getting the most support from NASA, as NASA has helped to facilitate four private astronaut missions to the International Space Station, three of which have already flown successfully, and the fourth one's coming up soon. It seems, though, that Axiom is subcontracting out most of the actual hardware, and will primarily be the operators of their station. Their first and second modules are being built by the Italian company Tails Alenia Space, and they plan to launch the first module in early 2026. They have many other partners as well that we will talk about more in a future video, especially a new American contractor called Gravitix Space, which just got a contract from Axiom for $125 million to build the third module for Axiom Station, and possibly more work as well. Next on the NASA Partners list, we have Blue Origin's Orbital Reef Project in partnership with Sierra Space. Orbital Reef aims to be a mixed-use station that creates an ecosystem where a whole bunch of different industries can work in space. Blue Origin plans to build the core modules that other modules and spacecraft will dock to. Sierra Space is responsible for the round, inflatable modules they call life modules. Sierra Space will also be providing cargo with their Dream Chaser space plane and may provide crew transport in the future as well. Boeing is also involved with the project, but everything is in question right now for Boeing, and it's possible that they might not be able to deliver. Let's not dwell on Boeing's problems for now. Blue Origin is usually... Um, secretive, so to find out about their progress, I'm going to have to dig a little bit deeper into the NASA contracts and report my findings when I have a little bit of a better understanding. Right now I only have rumors, and the biggest rumor I've heard is that they're having a little bit of trouble with the windows that they're planning on installing on their large core modules, but I haven't confirmed anything yet. Meanwhile, though, Sierra Space has conducted several burst tests of their inflatable module on actual hardware and exceeded not only their own pressure expectations, but NASA's safety requirements as well. Sierra Space wants to launch a Pathfinder version of Life module by the end of 2026. And interestingly, if Blue Origin isn't ready by 2026 for whatever reason, Sierra Space may continue the project on their own. Moving right along, though, to the next NASA partner, we have Star Lab, which was started by NanoRacks. NanoRacks has been a key player in the space industry for a couple of years now, launching commercial payloads to the International Space Station and from the International Space Station with their CubeSat deployer and their Bishop airlock, the second commercial module docked to the International Space Station ever after Bigelow's beam module. NanoRacks, though, was acquired by another company called Voyager Space, who also acquired several other smaller space companies. And Voyager Space is kind of emerged as a major player in this whole commercial space station project. This whole Star Lab project is really interesting to me because it's already an international collaboration. The European company Airbus is building Star Lab's primary module and has joint ownership of the project. They're investing their own money into this. Originally, Voyager Space was partnering with Lockheed Martin using their inflatable tech that they were developing, but confidence in their technology and possibly disagreements with Lockheed Martin led to them being dropped from the project. Airbus replaced Lockheed, and the two companies, Airbus and Voyager, even started a new jointly owned company, Star Lab LLC, to manage the project. Since then, they've gotten several more partners, such as Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, who are not only a partner in this project, but a stakeholder as well, paving the way for Japanese involvement in the project. Mitsubishi is also highly likely to contribute their HTVX cargo vehicle, their new and improved cargo vehicle, which they're developing for International Space Station resupply and potentially Gateway resupply as well. And then there's the Canadian company MDA. They've also joined the Star Lab project as both a partner and a shareholder. That means that Star Lab will definitely be getting a robotic Canada arm system. <laughs> 
Northrop Grumman had their own station design and contract with NASA from the first four that were chosen. But they actually abandoned their project and have since then joined the Star Lab project instead, using their Cygnus cargo vehicle with upgraded docking capabilities so that they can dock, not just berth. And at the beginning of 2024, Northrop dropping out actually led to Star Lab and Orbital Reef getting more money for their development from NASA. So now Northrop might be offering other stuff for Star Lab, or maybe parts of their station idea used to expand Star Lab. The interesting thing, though, is Northrop already contracts out a lot of their work for Cygnus to Tails Alenia Space. Northrop probably planned to work with Tails Alenia again for their modules, but either way, whatever Northrop is offering is already an international thing. All of these partners on Star Lab each bring their own unique designs and visions for how humans will live and work in space. I think this is really exciting. The competition seems to be heating up, getting serious, and that's good news for the future of space exploration. So here's my plan. I would like to do more videos about each project individually so that we can really nerd out about the engineering details because there's a lot of interesting developments and it would make this video way too long. To me, it seems that whoever wins this race, it's going to be a win for Tails Alenia, because they're involved in almost all of the projects on some level. Nothing's for certain yet, and this is still a competition, even between the partners. And yet there's still one more group that I haven't mentioned yet that actually I have the most confidence in. While many companies are vying to lead the race and build the first commercial space station, Vast Space may be the closest one to making it a reality. Their Haven 1 demo module is the first that, that may be sent to space, and it's scheduled for the summer of 2025 aboard a Falcon 9 rocket. What's even more impressive to me is that Vast Space has achieved this without a paid contract from NASA. While other companies are receiving NASA funding and support through the Commercial LEO Destinations program, Vast Space is blazing their own trail, showing what's possible through private investments and partnerships. Their founder, Jed McCaleb, seems to have enough money from businesses that he started in the past and through blockchain Bitcoin type of stuff. Apparently, he's got enough money to open up a facility like this. Holy crap. <laughs> they do have an unfunded space agreement with NASA now to exchange technical data, but they didn't at first. <sighs> the thing that's crazy about this is that they have the tools to build Haven 1, and it's going to fit nicely onto a Falcon 9. They even seem to have a really close relationship with SpaceX and employ former SpaceX engineers, as well as contract Tom Mueller's company Impulse Space to make the thrusters for this station. Tom Mueller is a legend in the rocket engine world and designed most of the engines used on the Falcon 9 and Dragon capsule. The Haven 1 demo might be exactly the same size as a Falcon 9 upper stage, and it makes me wonder if they've borrowed equipment from SpaceX or if SpaceX at least directed them to the same supplier to buy those same size tools from. SpaceX is going to deliver crew to the Haven 1 module with their Dragon capsule, and the window at the end of the Haven module seems to look just like the cupola that SpaceX flew on the Inspiration4 mission. So maybe they can just buy a cupola from SpaceX, I'm not sure. Vast is still in the test article stage, unless this right here is the actual flight module. They still have a lot of work ahead of them, but because of the people that they're employing, like Garrett Reisman, Dennis Stone, and Molly McCormick, and after seeing the equipment that they have, right now, that's why I have the most confidence in Vast. I believe in those people. I've met them before. I know what they're capable of. Things can change quickly in this whole space station race, but right now, Vast Space is scheduled to launch into space first by summer of next year, and at least six months earlier than their next biggest competitor, Axiom, who's planning on launching no earlier than spring of 2026. Obviously, that could all change, but that's the plan right now. If vast space succeeds, the Haven 1 module could be the first fully private space staging module to reach orbit, beating out the competition with NASA backing. 
it's a pretty bold move and one that might just redefine the space station race and determine who gets the big bucks. So how will these space stations get to space, get their supplies, and get their crew? There's really only a few options. Today, only SpaceX can deliver crew with Dragon, which can also deliver cargo, and SpaceX will be launching a lot of these space station modules with either their Falcon 9 rocket or Starship. <clears throat> you know. Starship could also win the race itself by being a space station in its own right. SpaceX already has plans to have a Starship refueling tanker permanently in orbit, so the idea of having a Starship space station really isn't that absurd. Either way, SpaceX wins by offering their rockets and their capsules to deliver cargo and crew. Northrop Grumman's Cygnus spacecraft is available now, and we can expect it to serve future space stations as well. Even though they're partnering with Starlab, I don't think that they would say no if somebody else offered to pay them to deliver to a different station. Rumor has it that Northrop Grumman likes money. Can, can, can anyone confirm that? <laughs> Sierra Space is in the process of launching their first Dream Chaser to the International Space Station to certify it for flight, and they also have a few cargo missions that NASA has contracted them for to deliver before the ISS retirement. But instead of upgrading the Dream Chaser for crew, they seem to be looking into building another, slightly bigger space plane to deliver crew to and from space. And then there's Boeing, which... Forget about Boeing for a moment. To cheer everybody up, I'd like to mention that we have a new contender entering the cargo delivery race. A European company is developing what they call the Nix capsule, which has already secured contracts from Axiom and Vast Space to deliver cargo to their space stations. This company is called the Exploration Company, and the people who are involved with this company are the same people who made the European cargo vehicle for the ISS, the ATV vehicle. And not only do these people have the experience, but the contacts in the industry to fast-track their product. Yes, it looks just like a Dragon capsule, but so what? We need more spaceships. And if it works, I'm not going to complain. As a matter of fact, the European Space Agency has started their own commercial cargo competition program and so far have selected two companies to develop cargo spacecraft. Nix got one of the contracts, and guess who got the other contract? Yep, that's right. Tails Alenia Space. <laughs> Man, Tails Alenia is really going for it, and I love it. This shows that competition is heating up not just for building these space stations, but for supporting them as well. So, for real, space could become the next frontier for manufacturing, where products like advanced materials and even 3D printed human organs are made in conditions that we just can't replicate on Earth. Yeah, that's right, human organs. If we can get just that to work, then we're gonna need a lot of hearts and kidneys back here on Earth. And if the cost of a space heart can be affordable enough, the demand for that could be huge. I want one. I'm going to need one in like 20 years from now, so let's get going on that, guys. If we can get that to work, and the more that the cost goes down, the more demand that there's going to be for space hearts, and a greater need for stations and re-entry capsules to bring those space hearts back to Earth quickly. In fact, there's a company called Varda Space that already has re-entry capsules for crystalline growth and drugs made in space, and I'm sure that they would love to get an order for thousands of delivery capsules. In fact, the Dream Chaser space plane could potentially take space hearts from a space station and land them at almost any airport in the world. And then it's just a quick drive from the airport to a hospital from there. But also consider this. Space stations will directly create jobs in engineering, manufacturing, operations, and maintenance. And for every job that's directly created by space exploration, there's often several more jobs that are created in related industries. That could include the supply chain from tech developers to the material suppliers, and that in turn will affect the local economies and the global economy as well. The economic argument is one of an investment in future capabilities, future innovation, and global economic health. 
rather than short-term profit. I know there's a lot of investors who don't want to hear that, but it's the truth. While the direct financial returns might be hard to quantify in traditional terms, the indirect benefits, the job creation, the technological leaps, and not to mention the inspiration for future generation, at least to me, arguably justifies the investment in these commercial space stations. The race to commercialize space is happening right now. It is already underway. And I want that future. I want a future that I can thrive in and a future that I can collaborate with anyone from around the world on. That's the future that I want. What kind of future do you want? Well, that's it for this video. What do you think about this? Do you think that these space stations are going to help make space more accessible for everyone? Let us know in the comments, and if you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to tomorrow, like this video, and uh, click the bell so that you're notified whenever we have more videos in the future. Because I do want to go into that deep dive about each and every one of these commercial space stations and the engineering and technical details behind them. I find that stuff super, super interesting, but I wanted to kind of get a baseline of where we at so far and how we got here with these four different commercial space station projects already under way. So thank you very much for watching this video and until next time, keep looking up and don't forget, Ad Astra to the stars.